I'm going to start with this slide to make a clarification about bacterial speciation that I learned uh, yesterday when I was researching for today's class. The concept of species in bacteria, it's very different than the concept of species that we have for, for example, mammals. When you look at a tiger and a lion, you know there are different species. Now, if we were to apply the same level of species definition to a lion and a tiger, basically saying that if you were to take lion DNA and hybridize it to tiger DNA, they will be more than 70% homologous. And therefore, because also they have more than 97% similarity into the 16S RNA, by this measure, a lion and a tiger will come out to be the same species. So we cannot apply the same level of scrutiny that we do for microorganisms to higher organisms. Otherwise, the data comes uh, really interesting, and according to that, humans, chimpanzees, and gorillas are the same species as well. Remember, we share more than 95% of our genome with chimpanzees. It's so only about 4% about of the genes that are different. So, because of the fact that microorganisms cannot be seen, we cannot apply the same level of morphological and uh, uh, differentiation that we can do for a mammal. I mean, you can look at a gorilla and look at a human, and though some of our cousins look very similar to gorillas, uh, they're not. They may be dragging their knuckles down the ground, but they are not gorillas. So, I just wanted to remind you to this issue, that this is a special uh, mechanism to look at microorganisms because we cannot do the same level of macroscopic analysis that we do with other organisms, okay? So that's what I wanted to say about that. So that is from the last lecture. I'm going to now go on to the, the other one. Now, this lecture today, it's going to be an overview of microbial diversity. This is going to be a bird's eye view. It's going to be a lot of information being thrown at you, and it's going to cover many chapters. So I also wanted to, uh, when I was doing the lecture and trying to finish it, I looked at chapter 15, and I want to include also the readings from 15.1 to 15.5 into this uh, reading material. What this is going to give you, it's an overview of microbial diversity. We can take an entire class to study this in detail, but we're not going to do it. We're going to do this in one lecture. As we discussed earlier, bacteria, because of forces of mutation, natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow, are going to go through a process of speciation. And speciation basically is a process in which a bacterial species becomes another. So, when we do the analysis of the 16S ribosomal RNA, as Carl Woos did, you can see that we came through the three domains of life. And bacteria, archaea, and eukarya all became an independent domain that has specific qualities that makes them unique to one another. And as we discussed, we have this uh, unique ancestor Luca, which eventually diverged into the lineage of bacteria and the lineage of archaea, and eventually that archaea ancestor also diverted into what is now the archaea domain and the eukarya domain. And that is why we decided in the last class that you're going to have certain similarities between archaea and eukarya that are not present in bacteria. One of the main ones, for example, is their um, archaea and eukarya, their ribosomes are not sensitive to the antibiotics that we use against bacteria because the structure of the ribosome in archaea and eukarya are very similar and the antibiotics that we currently have that target uh, ribosomes in bacteria are useless against archaea, for example. So now let's take another look at microbial diversity and as you know, we were talking about the adaptation that results into a great uh, microbial diversity. We're going to be looking that we have about 6,000 species described. That is actually an underestimation. The paper that I'm citing over here from 2002, looking at from Curtis, is estimating the entire bacterial diversity in the sea. 
goes to about 2 million species. And the entire soil diversity goes to about 4 million different species. So together with the soil and uh, ocean bacteria and water bacteria, we get about 6 million species of microorganisms. And that is an underestimation of what we believe is actually out there, which is close to about 10 million species. Compare that with 500 bugs, 500,000 uh, insect species, which is very, very diverse for animals. So the diversity um, in eukaryotes, when we look at microbes, about 50,000. So bacterial diversity and archaea diversity overshadows the diversity of eukaryotes by a lot. Now, as you know, and we discussed, the microbes, because of their high rate of mutation and generation time being small, they are going to gain mutations. Most of those mutations are going to be uh, non-beneficial. But once you have a selective pressure, for example, they're going to gain better fitness. Those microbes are going to survive. And eventually, they are going to differentiate into new species, generating a lot of diversity. So how do we classify all those microorganisms? Well, we can use taxonomy. And taxonomy, we look in the previous class, some of the tricks that we use is looking at the morphology. Streptococcus, looking at the fact that they are cocci and they arrange themselves in a group of like grapes. So you can use that kind of things. What do they use? Um, excuse me. So you can look at that diversity for the microscope because we can see that they're cocci and that they are associated in strep. We can look at the metabolic diversity. Lactobacillus, for example. They are using lactose as a source of carbon. So we know that because of their capacity to metabolize lactose, they are different from other bacteria that cannot do that. So we can have a really good look at the biochemical nature of those microorganisms to classify them that way. Do they have the enzyme catalase? Are they catalase positive or catalase negative? We can use that to classify them. We're going to also look that they are going to have varied ecological diversity. Some microorganisms are going to live in the water. Other ones are going to live in soil. That water could be acidic or basic. That water could be high in salt concentration. So all that we can use. And last but not least, of course, the genetic diversity that they have looking at the advances in molecular biology and sequencing to then be able to look at how related different organisms are to one another. Why do we classify them? Well, it's going to allow us to organize that vast knowledge of what they do into more compact groups, and therefore we can get information about them that easily. So you have access to information. If you find an organism that is similar to another one, you can make a prediction about that organism's biology based on a very closely related neighbor. Salmonella and E. coli are very closely related to one another. So the predictions that you can make on E. coli can apply to Salmonella and vice versa. And of course, we like to have things organized in groups. And therefore, those meaningful groups can facilitate when we communicate with other scientists or other doctors or other people doing policy to have bacteria and say, you know what, when we're talking about enteric bacteria, everybody knows that those are bacteria that are present in the gut because we have classified them by groups. And of course, more apply mechanisms, if we have a group of organizing microorganisms that make their identification easy, then we can get really good amount of information about them. And think about this medically. If we can think, you know what, this is a gram-positive microorganism. Therefore, that microorganism by that classification is going to be more sensitive to this antibiotic. So we have a lot of benefit to gain from the classification of these organisms. Now, we have looked at the classification that we have seen, and we can divide it into two major realms, the phylogenetic uh, diversity, which is the one that is going to look at how the genome, its diversity is evolving with different lines, and we can do that with the molecular tools, as Carl Wolf did, by taking, for example, the 16S RNA and comparing the sequences of organisms by that way. But we can also have the functional 
diversity. And that functional diversity is going to exclusively look at the diversity from basically the form of the microorganisms as well as their function and how that is related to their physiology and their ecology. These are not independent measures of classification. They need to be used together because we're going to be seeing that often, oftentimes phylogenetic analysis is not sufficient and we need to use other tools. So both physiological and functional diversity are going to help us better categorize bacteria and archaea and we're going to see that this is going to be especially true for eukarya. We're going to see that the 18S RNA sequencing that we can use to do phylogenetic analysis in eukarya is not as reliable as the 16S phylogenetic analysis in bacteria and archaea and therefore on those bases alone we do not have the actual picture of microbial eukaryotic evolution. We have to tag it with something else. Now, let's look at functional diversity more closely. We're going to look that sometimes a functional trait aligns with a phylogenetic group. For example, being gram-positive falls into two different groups of bacteria, the phenicules and the actino groups. We're going to look at that more carefully in a moment. I most, I most likely mispronounce the name, so don't hold it against me when you listen to the video. But not often the case, because some bacteria are going to be able to have if we look at, for example, a functional capacity to use hydrogen, many bacteria are able to use hydrogen that are in different phylogenetic groups. So we cannot use that alone. They have to come together. So some bacteria may be able, may have undergone a gene loss. Remember, we're talking about genetic drift, and they can lose a gene. And therefore, they may have lost a capacity with a neighbor, and you cannot use that to use that, or they had gained a capacity and now they are different from their, um, their related groups because by gaining that capacity through horizontal gene transfer, now they're able to do something that their related cousins cannot do anymore. And some microorganisms are going to undergo convergent evolution. That means that independently of their lineage, both of them, for example, evolve to use hydrogen as an energy source. And we see that, for example, in fish. Think about a shark, think about a dolphin. In, by convergent evolution, they both gain the capacity to have fins. They're not coming from the same lineage. A dolphin came out from a mammal, from, from, the, from land, who eventually moved into the ocean, and by convergent evolution, its entire body structure developed fins, the legs in the back, went away, they have those um, vestigial, thank you. So you have vestigial limbs in whales, for example, that show that eventually, at one ancestor, they had hind legs. But when you look at a whale and look at a whale shark, they look very similar by convergent evolution, okay? So in a similar fashion, microorganisms could have gained the capacity to do a metabolic pathway by convergent evolution, okay? So now, when we look at functional diversity, we can categorize it at three different groups. Physiological diversity, which basically looks at the functions and activities of microorganisms based on metabolism and biochemistry. Can they metabolize glucose and how that glucose is metabolized? You have glycolysis or you have the ebner dudorov pathway, for example. Morphological differences, spirochetes, are a microorganism that we can categorize because of their morphology. They look like little coarse screws. Cocci, we can put them in by their morphology. And then we have ecological diversity. Bacteria growing and how that relationship with their environment allows them to be categorized. Halobacterium, the fact that they grow in high salt concentration from halo. It's salt loving. So we can use that to now have functional diversity come in to help us categorize organisms according to their physiology, their morphology, and their ecological diversity. You add that now to the phylogenetic analysis by molecular studies, and you have a really good way to organize microorganisms into different patterns and see how they have evolved. Okay? So, questions so far? All right. 
So let me then show you this um, diagram over here. And this diagram over here, it's showing the um, phyla of Archaea in red. So you can see the phyla of Archaea here in red. So we look at the five different Archaea phyla, and we're looking at the almost, uh, I think this is looking at 27 different bacteria phyla. And what they're doing is that they're connecting them by their phylogenetic group, but now in colors, they're putting their um, functional diversity. So for example, look here in that pink bot, pink drop, uh, pink circle, excuse me, that's hydrogen oxidation. So hydrogen oxidation can be observed here in this crino archaea, but it's also found here in this urea archaea in thermostate, which is a bacteria, and that bacteria there, let's just for the sake of time not repeat all the types, here in this bacteria, chloroflexly, this one cyanobacteria is able to do it. Look at the firmicutes, the firmicutes are the gram-positive ones, and the actinobacteria is the other gram-positive ones, so actinocutes and firmicutes, firmicutes from firm outside, remember, gram-positive have this strong peptidoglycan layer, so it's a firm cell wall. So firmicutes and actinobacteria are all the gram-positive. Notice also, epsilon bacteria, so exilon protobacteria, excuse me, Here's alpha protobacteria, gamma protobacteria, and beta protobacteria. All of them have the capacity to oxidize hydrogen. So the phylogenetic lineage doesn't predict which microorganism is going to get the capacity to oxidize hydrogen. And the same thing can be applied to any of these other functional uh, capacities that they have. All right. So in this kind of picture that you're seeing here, if there is one member of the phylum that can do one of these biochemical analysis, you get a dot. So that's why you can now appreciate from a bird's eye view the great diversity of biochemistry that the organisms have. Look, for example, at photosynthesis. Here we have oxygenic photosynthesis being in green and an oxygenic photosynthesis being here in purple. So when we look at that dark green, cyanobacteria definitely is the only bacteria that can do oxygenic photosynthesis. No other bacteria can do oxygenic photosynthesis, only cyanobacteria. But when you look at the purple one, which is down here, look that you have chloroflexy, you have firmicules, so some gram-positive bacteria do photosynthesis. It's not oxygenic, but they do it. It's anoxygenic. And here, nitrosospora, and here, alpha proteal bacteria. That's as a gram negative bacteria. The alpha proteal bacteria are gram negative and they do photosynthesis anoxygenically, and a member of the gram positive bacteria also do anoxygenic photosynthesis. So you can see that when you combine phylogeny with function, you get a better idea of how the organisms are organized. Now, when we look at metabolic diversity, as we have learned before, we can look at the energy source, the carbon source, and the source of protons. I mean, excuse me, electrons. So when you look, for example, here at these microorganisms that are chemotrophs, so they're going to derive their energy from a chemical molecule, you have the ones over here and the top, which are the chemoorganotrophs, which, as you know, are going to derive their electrons from an organic compound like glucose. And at the bottom, you have the chemolithotropes, which are getting the electrons from some kind of inorganic compound. Hydrogen gas, hydrogen sulfide, iron, there's ammonium ion. All of those can give electrons to families, to bacteria in this family. And eventually, if they're going to get the electron and now produce oxygen at the end, that is an oxygenic respiration. But if they get the electrons from an inorganic molecule and eventually give it to oxygen, that still is oxygenic respiration. Now, if they give it to some other kind of molecule like sulfur, here is nitrite, uh, here is sulfate, or some other kind of now organic acceptor, that is going to be an anaerobic respirer, 
we're going to look at respiration being aerobic if it if the ultimate electron acceptor is oxygen or anaerobic if some other molecule it's going to receive the electron so if both chemo um, organotrophs or chemolysotrophs can receive electrons that are not necessarily among the respirers excuse me the other molecule other than oxygen can receive those electrons so you have a lot of diversity that you can understand there and of course if their energy came from light and if they're going to get the carbons from either an organic molecule or from CO2. You have all that kind of diversity. You can use that. Morphology. As we have mentioned, many species can be categorized by morphology. So if the bacteria is a cocos, if it's a rod, if it's a little um, squiggly spirulum, the spirochetes, course group. We're going to look more carefully that certain groups are defined by their morphological diversity. The spirochetes, the budding and the appendages bacteria, these guys, for example, they attach themselves to a substrate by a stalk. So all the bacteria, once they stop being swimmers, they attach themselves by a stalk and they hang out. And when they hang out, they divide that one bacteria is still remain attached to their substratum and the other one now swims until it finds another place to attach themselves. Those are going to be the stalk bacteria. And other ones have hyphae, like in this case. So hyphomicrobium, we're going to look, that has hyphae. And hyphae resembles the hyphae that you have in fungi. The bacteria have elongations. And of course, the filamentous bacteria here. So when we look at some of the bacteria that have morphology and morphology as the way to categorize them, certain families have been, uh, certain groups, excuse me, have been organized by their morphology. The spirochetes and the spirilla. They're all categorized by their morphology. And in here, I put an example of two pathogens. So Triponema, that is a bacteria that causes syphilis. And Borrelia, we talked about it earlier, that is a microorganism that uh, is going to cause Lyme disease. So from the budding and the prostate or the stock bacteria, the hyphomicrobium has the hyphae, and the colobacters are the ones who attach themselves by a stock. Now, some bacteria, they form sheath around themselves with a polysaccharide, so they look like they're inside a little tube. And those are the sheath bacteria. So you have the Shirothelus and the Leptotrix. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Those are sheath microorganisms, and you, all of the members are going to have that common quality. And last but not least, I love these guys, the magnetic bacteria. The magnetic bacteria, all of them have magnetosomes inside their cytoplasm. And magnetosomes are basically crystals of magnetite. Iron oxide, Fe3O4. And the cool thing is that they align themselves with the magnetic poles. And that helps them live in micro aerophilic environments where they can be in that interface where the oxygen is concentration is low enough for them to respire. And the ones which are in the northern hemisphere align themselves to the north. The one in the southern hemisphere align themselves to the south. So it's a really cool organ. And when you look at them by morphology, you can see that beautiful arrangement of crystals inside the microorganisms. What morphology does do is that it allows you to distinguish, for example, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. You can see that easily by morphology. Lack of the nucleus, like you say. Lack of those organelles that you can distinguish microscopically. What it doesn't do, it's tell you the difference between two bacteria that look the same. Two, if you were to look at E. coli and Salmonella, you would not be able to distinguish it morphologically because they're both rods and they both have peritricious flagellum. You cannot tell them apart. Now, that is the problem with this. It's inefficient to distinguish macros that have the same morphology and therefore now is when we can use these other issues like metabolism and environment to be able to tell them about better. So you're going to take not only the phylogenetic analysis but also morphology and tag it together with other features to distinguish them, ecology and biochemistry. All right? No questions so far? All right. So now let's look at ecological diversity. As you know, we discussed the planet has many different 
ecosystems. And at every ecosystem, you're going to have microorganisms. From the Arctic, growing the sacrophiles, to the thermal vents at 120 degrees, where you have hyperthermophiles. It could be at the bottom of the ocean, in deep pressure, or in other places. And some scientists have a lot of fun going into the field, into these extreme environments, and catching new organisms. So looking at temperature, hyperthermophiles, sacrophiles, salinity, freshwater, sea water, and salt lake. We're talking about four molar salt concentration in some of these high salt lakes. The concentration of salt in the seawater is not four molar. It's actually a lot less than that. And remember, we talk about water activity. So the water activity, even in an aqueous environment, because of the solid concentration is so high, the water activity is very low. We're going to look at halophiles, which like to live in those environments. We talk about pH, the acidophiles and the alkalophiles. And now, I'll introduce you to you. We kind of alluded to this about that exercise that we did with the bacteria that live in the bottom ocean. We have barophiles, microorganisms that require high pressure, because that's where they are used to be found. So when you look at the ecological diversity, these microorganisms are not tolerating them. They're not tolerating the salt. They have adapted to be able to actually require those conditions. Remember what we discussed about the conditions in halobacteria that require sodium for the stability of their external proteins. High sodium concentrations. So again, they're just not adapting. They are requiring them in order to survive. So this table here from the old book, they took it out from the current book that we have, it's showing some of the examples of these extremophiles. And again, when you look, for example, at a high temperature, you have Pyrobolus fumari, which is an archaea. Archaea are the only extreme hyperthermophiles. Bacteria can't handle that. Why? Yes. The cell membrane, exactly. The bacterial cell membrane is a bilayer, and because of the bilayer, eventually high temperatures, it collapses. The cell membrane of archaea, especially the ones which are hyperthermophiles, is a monolayer. And therefore, it cannot separate by high temperature. So now, again, the minimum temperature is 90 degrees. Put your hands in 90 degree water. We know what happens. We get scalded. Their optimal temperature is 106 degrees, and the maximum is 113. Though we know now that some of the bacteria recently discovered live in thermal water at 121 degrees Celsius. Very hot. Now, the sacrophiles, bacteria in this case, Polaromoras vacuolata, I like that name, um, there are no archaea living in those cold temperatures. Bacteria, I guess, because of the same issue. The membrane allows them to live at those cold temperatures. Their membrane is adapted to be more fluid when they're living in those temperatures. And again, the minimum is zero degrees, the optimum is four degrees, and the maximum is 12. You put that at 15 degree temperature, the bacteria will die. So they'll be happy living in our fridge at four degrees, but not more. And our fridge varies in temperature every time we open the door. So they're not going to be very happy. Now, calophiles and acidophiles love to live in high or low acid conditions. So Picrophilus oshimai, this is a bacteria, excuse me, it's an archaea, that lives in an acid hot spring. So basically, that the pH of that spring is 0 0.7. Do the calculation of how many protons there is in that pH. Our acidity of our stomach is 2. And remember, the, the pH scale is logarithmic. On top of that, those are growing at 60 degrees Celsius. Other microorganisms like this alkalophile, Natronobacterium gregori, is another archaea lived in a soda lake. The pH optimum is 10. Any of you know of a soda lake in California? Huh? I saw the lake in California. All you have heard about Mono Lake? In the other side of Yosemite? Mono Lake is a solar lake. The pH is about 10. There's some beautiful solar lakes in Africa. 
You've seen the National Geographic uh, um, special where you have the flamingos in water and you have all these flamingos only in that lake. Those are usually about 10 to 12 pH. And the flamingos are eating the shrimp that can grow at that pH. And guess what the, fringe are, the shrimp are eating? Microorganisms, exactly. So some of the microorganisms are able to grow there. They photosynthesize. The edges of the, of the soda lake crystallize because of the high concentration of, I forgot the name of the compound. But in that ecosystem, the, the shrimp eat the microorganism. Now the flamingo eat the shrimp. The flamingo turns pink. Anyway, really cool. So this guy, Moritella yajunosi, it's a barophile living in the deep ocean sediments. The optimum is 700 atmospheres. That will make your head explode. That's how much pressure. It can sustain over a thousand atmospheres according to this table. So really high pressure. And of course, last thing, halophiles, Halobacterium salinarum, the name, Halobacterium lexa salinarum salty. It's the kind of bacteria that lives in, for example, the salt lake. And we're going to look at that right now. The optimum percentage that it likes is 25% salt. Really high concentration. Anyway, so the halophiles. Here is a picture that most of you probably had seen when you're flying over the Bay Area. If you look out of your window outside of SFO as you're flying, you're going to see these areas of water that are colored. Those are um, lakes that are salt, uh, called evaporation ponds where we actually harvest salt. And the reason why they are that color is because you have red and purple halobacteria that are producing bacterial rhodopsin, which is a enzyme that takes light and makes uses light to make uh, a proton gradient, and therefore they get energy from that. But they also have bacterial ruberines, which are another pigment for this. So those beautiful colors that you can see there are resulting from that microorganism um, using them for energy production. As you may imagine, being in those, salt high in those high salt concentrations, they need to balance their solute inside so their water doesn't rush in and makes them burst. So they have internal cytoplasm of 5.3 molar potassium ions to counter the huge sodium concentration, about 4 molar, in the outside. It doesn't matter that it's a different ion. It's a solute concentration that is now at the same concentration. So high concentration of potassium in the inside matches the high concentration of sodium in the outside. Water doesn't rush in. Remember, we talk about the compatible solutes, all right? And as we mentioned, those enzymes are going to be really needing to use that. Anyway, um, they use bacterial rhodopsin to get ATP. And when you look inside of them, compare the concentration of sodium in the outside in their medium to the concentration of potassium in the inside, a compatible solute that is going to allow them to maintain osmolotic uh, balance. All right? So this is another example of an organism and how it doesn't only tolerate those environments, it actually needs them to thrive, and it has evolved in order to survive very well in them. Okay, so now let's take a look at bacterial phylogeny in more detail. And again, this image over here, it's showing you the 29 phyla, and the size of the arm that you're seeing, it's proportional to the number of microorganisms inside that graph. So as you can appreciate, proteobacteria, it's very large. Next are going to be actinobacteria and the firmicutes, which are the gram-positive microorganisms, a tiny bit, and we'll talk about it, at the ternicutes. Forget about everything about cell wall that I taught you. Ternicutes don't have cell walls. Tenery means soft. These guys don't have a cell wall, so no bacteroglycan. And they're pathogens because they need to live inside cells. We're going to look at them. And the last but not least, the bacteroides. All the other ones, the reading will give you a tiny little introduction. I am just going to remain with the big, more populous ones. So this image over here, it's showing you the phylet that we can cultivate. But the thing is, is that, as you, we have discussed, with that example that we did in lecture, not often you can cultivate them. 
So we tend to put this under a phyla that we call the candidate phyla, which include a lot of environmental organisms that we know exist because we can detect their DNA in the environmental sample. Take soil, isolate the DNA from soil, do the phylogenetic analysis, and you start to see samples. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a pseudomonas. Well, this is a um, clostridium. You know what? This is an environmental isolate. We cannot cultivate the microorganism, but we can see it because it's leaving us their DNA. So by a process called metagenomics, you can now categorize those organisms and find them as environmental isolates because they're there in the environment. We just don't know how to culture them yet. So this graph over here, we think that most likely there's about 80 phyla instead of this 29 because we have not gotten all the organisms that are at the bottom of the sea inside the gut of God knows what kind of creature in the soil in the Sahara Desert in a cave hiding somewhere in Central America. And that is when scientists like you who want to get your boots dirty and go down into the jungle, go inside crawling in the cave, spelunking, and then get samples of everything that is there, now you can discover the new species and hopefully figure out a way of um, culturing them. And therefore you can have them as well. Most likely initially you're going to see them as environmental isolates. And this is what this is showing. In green, you have the type species that we can cultivate. And in red, you have the number of species that are believed to exist that are only environmental isolates. Notice, for example, here um, you have the protobacteria divided by their subdivisions, which are alpha, beta, delta, epsilon, gamma, and zeta. The zeta was shown here in red, but I found a paper. Here is the uh, the um, the link to it, that actually can cultivate those microorganisms in very funky ways. They use electrodes and pass electricity to them because these guys use iron as an electron donor. So they can electrocute them and they grow. It's super cool. So again, creativity, by understanding a little bit of what you may get from their biochemistry, gives you an idea of how to modify an environment and put them in a soft agar, electrocute them by a really low electric voltage, and all of a sudden the colonies start to appear. So not only putting things in agar for them to see, or giving them the iron that they need. So again, imagination works well in this case, problem solving. But as you see, as I mentioned, the green bars, culture microorganisms. And as you can see that some of this one, like the acidobacteria, the ones that we have culture, are vastly outnumbered by the ones that we have in culture that we can isolate from the environment and see them that they're present by their 16S RNA. So the diversity of microorganisms is a lot greater than what we can see by the ones that we can culture. So there's a lot of work that you still as microbiologists in training can do, okay? Now, let's take a look at the protobacteria because as you remember, it's one of the largest groups. And the protobacteria, um, it has been organized by the 16S RNA into um, different classes. As I mentioned, the alpha, here's the alpha, the beta, the delta, the gamma, the epsilon, and the zeta group. Of these ones, the alpha, the beta, the delta, and the epsilon are monophyletic, meaning that they have one ancestor that generated the entire group. And to show you that, I put a clay dot, that little circle, shows you the ancestors. So you can see, eventually you're going to look that, for example, down here in the delta and the, uh, and delta and the epsilon, you're going to be able to see that you have one ancestor and one ancestor. So all of them generated from one ancestor. The gamma has multiple ancestors that gave different groups. This color's coordination that you see here are their metabolic capacities. Notice that their metabolic capacity doesn't follow their phylogeny. An oxygenic phototrophy, it's found here in this gamma bacteria, here in this beta bacteria, and here in this alpha bacteria. As we discussed before, their metabolic capacity doesn't always jive with their phylogenetic groups. No one of all the group. The only one that that is happening, it's the Mariprofundis, which is the Zeta. 
because it's the only member that we know. So it's a member of one. Hey, my own clay over here. And they all use iron as a donor. That's the only one that kind of follows it there. So that clay because only is represented by one. So most likely, it's called Mari Profundis, ferro-oxidants. Mari Profundis from the deep sea, ferro-oxidants, because it's oxidizing iron. So again, the name, taxonomy, it's taking advantage of their environment as well as their metabolic capacity. You see, you see that? So it's really cool. So if you discover your own bacteria, you can just knock yourself silly naming them according to the best way that you can. So again, um, the gamma, it's, paraphy it's paraphylegic, meaning that you have multiple uh, ancestors in the group. The alpha, beta, delta, and epsilon are monophylegic. They form a clade, and all those clades have one ancestor. Okay? Now, let's take the alpha group, for example. The alpha group contains about 10 orders and 1,000 species alone. And here we have the Riquetzae, the Rhodospirilis, the Sphingomonadales, Sphingomonadales, the Colibacterias, the Rhodobacterias, and the Rhizobiums. Now, interesting over here, the Riquetzia causes disease. I'm just giving you an example because I love disease, so I'm just giving you that. So here, Riquetzia prowadzeki, it's the bacteria that causes typhus. And the Riquetzia riquetzi, it's the bacteria that causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever. If you ever go to Montana, you can go to the Rocky Mountain labs, and they study that disease there. It's passed by ticks, and there's a moat around the research facilities because the ticks will drown as they crawl out. That's why they put a moat. The moat is about that big. It's about a foot long because a tick cannot swim. If they were to escape, they will go into the moat and swim. It's really cool. We used to go there every year from Stanford to do a research project. But anyway, notice the big diversity that you have. Um, a lot of these guys, as I mentioned to you, like Wolbachia, is a pathogen that infects uh, insects. And we use it in fly studies because it actually can help funky things. It can actually help the tech, uh, change the gender of the fly embryo. You can deliver things. It's really cool. Anyway. So I am giving you this so you can get an idea of the major um, classes. The rhizobias. Here, for example, we're going to look at the Brady rhizobium. We're going to look at the Azo rhizobium. We're going to look at the... Where, where did it go? The rhizobia itself. There you go. I found it. All of those are symbiotic bacteria with plants. And they're going to fix nitrogen for the plant. So in that case, that kind of uh, group all cluster together very nicely. Now, the beta protobacteria, as I mentioned, came from one ancestor. I put the ancestor here with that dot so you can see it. Six orders, rhodocyclates, hydrogenophilates. Imagine what they like to use. Hydrogen. The Neisserialis. And there you have Chromobacterium and Neisseria. The Nitrosomonodales, Nitrosomonodales, and Methylophylates, they like to use methane, and the Burkoholderiales. I am sure that I am destroying those names, so I apologize for my terrible Latin pronunciation. Again, six orders, some members, about 500 different species. Here, again, because of disease, I want to... Oh, in the Neisseria, there are. Those are have the Neisseria meningitis and the Neisseria gonorrhea. All of them co cocci, which are gram-negative. Bordetella. It also uh, causes, what is it, pertussis. The, the whooping cough. So you have some pathogenic uh, genus in this, um, in this order. So in this class, excuse me, you have, don't forget to... Um, the orders are here. In this entire class, you have six orders, and in the six orders, you have some of the genus that are pathogenic. So again, really big um, diversity in their metabolism. Now, the largest one, the gamma proteobacteria. 
it has about 1,500 characterized species in 15 orders. Here is when you have, for example, at the bottom, the enterobacteria. All of them are the ones like Yersinia, Salmonella, Escherichia, Enterobacter, Clipselia, Proteus, gut microorganisms. Some of you know of them pathogenic, pathogenic, patho pathogenic, excuse me. Salmonella is pathogenic. Some Escherichia, E. coli, could be pathogenic. Definitely Yersinia. We talk about Yersinia pestis, the bubonic plague. Closely related to them are the vibrios. Vibrio uh, and alivibrio. Of the vibrio, you have pathogenic member there. Vibrio cholerae. Now, pastorella, another member that has pathogenic groups. All of these are bacilli. All of them are gram-negative. Here you go back to nitrococcus. Not all of them bacillus in that group. But what do they do? By the name, nitrogen. Legionella, definitely a pathogenic microorganism in there. Methylococcus, they use methane. Here, another one, here the pseudomonas. Those of you taking lab, notice the difference. Though they are gram-negative, they are rods, and they're related because they're part of the gamma protobacteria to E. coli and to serratia, they are not very close relatives to them, phylogenetically speaking. Look at them over here in this clade as opposed to this one down here. Now, so that metabolically diverse, some of them are, are phototrophic, so some of them are actually going to do photosynthesis and oxygenic. And they include chemoorganotrophs and chemolithotrophs. So they have a very large variety of um, metabolic pathways to use. Now, the, L, the delta and the epsilon, each of them separated into a different clade by an ancestor. Now, not very diverse in that sense, not as compared, for example, to the gamma protobacteria. So the delta protobacteria and the epsilon protobacteria, they have less species and less functional diversity. Um, interestingly here, the delta protobacteria, also here, delta sulforobacteria, the sulforobacteria, the sulfagrucus, all of them handle sulfur. So they have some common of uh, metabolic clade in organization happening in there. But it's not necessarily completely unique to them. Here, sulforospirillum can also use sulfate in the epsilon bacteria. Pathogenic bacteria here, helicobacter. Some of them, Helicobacter pylori, causes the bleeding ulcers in stomachs. So they're able to, they're, they have a tough uh, um, flagellum, and they like living at acidic pH. So, functional dippers. So see, what I'm trying to do here is not to give you a table to memorize absolutely every single one of these microorganisms. When you read the text, you're going to be taking a bird's eye view again about all of them. So read it with the idea of understanding the major differences and appreciating the very large metabolic and morphological diversity that the organisms have. I don't want you to memorize names. And if I'm going to give you a question about this in the test, I have always put the questions about this in the multiple choice part so you can take a chance to look through your book and get better information. Because again, I, you know that I hate you memorizing things that are useless. But I want you to learn material. So more important for me is the learning about the part about the classification that then you can use somewhere else when you go to grad school, med school, or whatever. Now, I'll continue with our bird's eye tour of microorganisms by looking at the gram-positive bacteria. Notice that the structure of the cell wall falls by now a classification, by a phyla. And this is why gram-positive microorganisms in the archaea are not considered true gram-positives because they're everywhere. They are not categorized either in the actino, like the, in bacteria, in the, in the actinobacteria or the firmicutes. Bacteria, uh, archaea that come out gram-positive-ish in their test, 
are not considered true gram-positive bacteria. Because phylogenetically speaking, they don't relate to this at all. So here, in the actomycetes, the actinobacteria, they have a particular group that is really interesting. They're the actinomycetales. Why? They are containing the actinomycetes. Those are the bacteria that are filamentous in nature, and they're the ones making most of the antibiotics that we know now. So they, the actinomyces and the streptomyces shown over here, they are awesome at making antibiotics. And when you look at the book, you're going to learn about a lot of these antibiotics when you read that part of the chapter. The problem is that a lot of those antibiotics, which are great against other bacteria, may be toxic to us. So that's why we have not yet explored. But looking for more actinomycetes and groups in this bacterial group, uh, phyla, it's a hot area of research because most of the possibility of getting new antibiotics for use medically. Now, the firmicutes over here, firm um, uh, cell wall, include bacteria like streptococcus or staphylococcus. As you know, pathogenic. So they do a lot of, uh, and the clostridium, a lot of the clostridium bacteria are pathogen too. Clostridium difficile in our gut, all of them anaerobic, they are terrible to cause inflammatory bowel disease. And of course, staphylococcus, terrible. A lot of the bacilli are related to staphylococcus, but the bacillus, we love them. They do a lot of really good things for us biochemically. Some of them pathogenic, but not that many. What I want you to know about this issue is that when you compare them genetically, the actinobacteria, they have a large proportion of their genome with a high GC content. So we tend to call the actinobacteria high GC content gram positive. On the other hand, the firmicutes have a low GC content. So we tend to call them the low GC content gram positives. Now, this little guy sitting here, the tenericutes, they don't have a cell wall. Somehow, one gram-positive bacteria must have lost the capacity to make peptidoglycan. And therefore, those microorganisms that are related to the firmicutes more closely now don't have a cell wall. And therefore, they are intracellular pathogens. The ones that is our bane in the lab are mycoplasma because mycoplasma can infect or our tissue culture cells. And to get rid of them, it's really difficult because they're internal. So anyway, um, just running on to you so you know that there is a bacteria out there that has no cell wall, and because it doesn't have cell wall, you cannot attack it with antibiotics that destroy and target cell wall synthesis. And they stay nicely and cozy inside other cells because in there, they do not have to worry about osmotic stress. Now, other group, again, and just giving you a bird's eye view of all the major groups, are the bacteroides. About 700 species of bacteria groups here, most of them gram negative, and they are also non sporulating bacteria. I forgot to mention that the other group have the sporulating ones. Remember, gram positive bacteria are sporulators. Um, they are important to us because a lot of the bacteria in our gut that help us digest our food are bacteroides. We're going to look at microorganisms releasing exoenzymes to the environment. The exoenzymes are going to be able to break down the polymers that we consume, and therefore our gut epithelial cells are going to be able then to absorb those nutrients. So the bacteroides family are really good at doing that. And as you may imagine, some of them are going to be human pathogens. Now, interestingly, this group right here, where did you go? Here, the sphingobacteriales, sphingobacteriales, I don't know if I pronounced that right, but there you go, are one of the few organisms that can make sphingolipids. Do you remember sphingolipids from Bio 110? They are a type of phospholipid that doesn't have glycerol, and it has a sphingosine. So it's very large, and it helps with mine. So they make that uh, order makes the sphingolipids. So they have the biochemistry to make that lipid that other bacteria do not use. All right, that stops 
my tour of the bacteria. I threw a lot of names at you. I want you to take a look, do the reading, get an idea of where they are. Now let's take a much even smaller trip with the archaea. And here are the archaea. The archaea domain, as you know, split away from the bacteria. They do have a morphological trait, which is the lack of phospholipids as we know them, because they have the phospholip the lipids in their membranes made from which molecule? Huh? You guys forgot already already? Huh? I have to wake you up too. Which molecule makes the archaeal cell membrane? Isoprenol. Well said. So isoprenol that gets together to form. What is the name of the phytanols or biphytanols? Well said. Thumbs up to Georgina. Anyway, so all of them share that. In the same way that all the bacteria share having lipids. Anyway, so you have Uri archaeota. Nano Archaeota, Cora Archaeota, Crina Archaeota, and Saum Archaeota. Those are the five different phyla there. Now, they do not have peptidoglycan later, they all have pseudopeptidoglycan. Interestingly, they, we believe that they are the originators of the eukaryotic RNA polymerase, the structure of the bacterial RNA polymerase of only five subunits. The, the Archaea and Eukarya has 12 subunits. So they have that in common with eukarya. Their metabolic and phenotypic diversity is immense. These are the extremophiles that we find in the highest salt concentration, highest temperature, highest pressure. These are them. And they are the only microorganisms that can make methane by anaerobic respiration. So these are the extremophiles. Again, bringing them to you so you can see that they have a really diverse group. They used to people believe that they were bacteria until Carl Woods discovered them by separating them according to their 16S RNA. They used to be all part of the group Monera. Remember, they were the Moneras by Whitaker. You have Monera, you have Protista, which are the eukaryotes, and after that you have animals, plants, and fungi. So we used to categorize archaea with bacteria under the Monera group because Microscopically, they look the same, and we didn't have the molecular tools to distinguish them. So this is the only thing that I'm going to show you. Chapter 16 is going to give you the more detail about this. And as you can see, time-wise, I do not have the time to go in detail about this microorganism. But when you read the chapter, you'll be responsible of understanding a lot about them. And the chapter is going to touch about all the morphological as well as their metabolical diversity. Last but not least, let's look at eukaryotes, because they are microorganisms after all. And what I want to show you is that when the six, when they don't have 16S, therefore we did the 18S RNA sequence analysis by them. And the issue with this 18S RNA analysis is that it's not as reliable as the 16S RNA sequence analysis. And therefore, scientists needed to then merge that with comparative sequence methods, looking at other molecules. Now, what I want to show you is the idea that the protists shown over here are the micro, microbes of the um, eukaryotic world. You also have some fungi in that group, and in the area of the plants, you have the red and the green algae. So you have photosynthetic microorganisms, you have fungi, you have something related to plants. Plants are shown over here in this little corner. Animals are here, and the big fungus are here in this other group. And as you see, that's just showing animals. It's not showing the diversity of animals. We're only concerning with microorganisms. But they are extremely dif uh, diversified. Now, let's talk about this issue of endosymbiosis once again, because the endosymbiotic relationship that that early eukaryote had, it was most likely drove the evolution of the eukaryotes. And I'll go back to this image in a moment, 
Because the whole thing is that we have that strong evidence about the endosymbiotic relation. And we kind of talked a little bit about it in class the last time. So we're looking at the fact that there was a primary symbiotic event in which a bacteria most likely was taking in and that bacteria became the mitochondria. And much later, another symbiotic event took a cyanobacteria and that became the chloroplast. So when we look at the chloroplast and the mitochondria, we see that they have their own genome and their genome is circular with the same organization of the genome of bacteria. One single origin of replication, for example. Circular structure. Only one copy of the genome. All of that, it's the same as bacteria. Now, we also see that the genome of the eukaryotes have genes that came out from bacteria. So therefore, there was some level of horizontal gene transfer from that symbiont into the nucleus of the host. For example, a lot of the genes for mitochondrial function are encoded in the nucleus, not on the chromosome of the mitochondria. So those genes, as we discussed in Bio 110, will be made in proteins. Those proteins are transported across the membrane of the mitochondria using the TIM and the TOM. Actually, TOM and TIM, because it's T-O-M for outer membrane and T-I-M for inner membrane. So the TOM and TIM system will bring those genes inside. But those are encoded in the nucleus. They have introns. The genes in the mitochondrial genome do not have introns. They're organized like bacteria. So now, when you sequence those genes, the 16S, uh, when you look at the mitochondria and the chloroplast, they have ribosomes. And when you look at the ribosomal genes, they fall squarely in the um, protobacteria for the mitochondria and in the cyanobacteria for the chloroplast. And last but not least, if you now treat the mitochondria and the chloroplast with antibiotics that are designed to inhibit bacterial translation, those organelles' translation is inhibited as well. So the ribosomes of the mitochondria and the chloroplast have the same structure and function as the ribosomal bacteria and therefore are sensitive to the same antibiotics. Now, I'm going to introduce you to another organelle that you probably never heard about before, and that is the hydrogenosome. The hydrogenosome is another organelle that, like mitochondria, it has its own um, DNA, it has its own ribosomes, but differently, it is present in a group called the amitochondriates, and inside the amitochondriates, that is able to provide ATP through fermentation. So it is a fermenting bat that is now providing energy through fermentation for the eukaryotic cell. And it's believed that it's part of an ancient lineage. So now, this is not the only way in which endosymbiotic happen. When we look back at this uh, um, uh, phylogenetic tree diagram, there is a point in here in which now we have green algae and red algae, and we see arrows that the red algae, it now was endosymbiosed by now a protist. And when you classify the chloroplasts of the protists, they look like green algae chloroplasts. And when you, for example, this, uh, the red algae, excuse me. And when you look at the green algae, they gave the chloroplast to two different kinds of protists. So we believe that there is a second symbiotic event that we call it secondary symbiosis. So here in this part of the image, you have what is the primary symbiotic event, which gave the mitochondria and the um, chloroplast to that early microorganism. That is when you establish now the red, uh, this little photosynthetic microorganism, which can now swim. Eventually, by evolution, uh, the chloroplast um, chlorophylls 
evolve and now you get the red alga and the green alga. And by a secondary endosymbiotic system, for example, euglena is believed to have phagocytose, a green alga, and the chrono, um, the chloro, oh God, I cannot pronounce his name, chloraramniophytes, whatever. That don't, excuse me, guys. That also uh, engulf that other microorganism. So you have a secondary um, symbiotic system that gave rise to now those for synthetic euglena. In the other hand, Apicomplexans, remember Apicomplexans, we talk about toxoplasmosis and malaria. So some other members of the Apicomplexan group have a secondary symbiosis with red alga, as well as the dinoflagellates. So you can look now at their genome sequence and they come more directly related to those unicellular alga than to the chloroplast of cyanobacteria. And that is the evidence. And the last slide that I want to show you is this one, because this secondary endosymbiosis is happening right now, as we speak, with many different species. All of us have gone snorkeling, most likely. How many of you have gone snorkeling at one point? We need to take you snorkel one of those days. Yes, you, Scott. Yeah. And anyway, when you look at the coral, the coral is brown in color. That brown color, it's not because it has dirt that has landed on it. That was my first impression as a kid growing in the Caribbean looking at the corals. It's dirty from the sun. It's actually not that. It's the presence of Susantelli, and the Susantelli are brown algae that the coral polyp, when it has evolved, when it has actually, when it comes out of the egg, fertilized, uh, eventually it absorbs this by endosymbiosis. Dr. Monica Medina, who used to be a professor here, used to do research on this. So she has strains of coral that had no uh, Susantelli in them. So the Susantelli, as you can see by this image, this is a polyp. Remember, coral is, a, is an organism that is communal. So you have multiple animals living in one apartment complex, which is the coral structure. And all the polyps is an independent organism living together. So now when you look at the epithelial of the coral, you can see that in the internal epithelial, you have all these little brown dots that are the symbionts that they have taken. And they take them from their environment and put them there. Here is a microscopic picture of the Susantelli in that coral. And they need that because what they're doing is that the coral, which is present in the tropical waters, can get now sunlight and the Susantelli can use that sunlight to produce oxygen, which is perfect for the, for the coral. Diseases that eradicate coral are diseases that we are now seeing that kill the Susantelli. So we call that coral bleaching. You see the coral when you get them dyed, it's completely white. And you have seen some of those, if you go uh, snorkeling, that there's some corals that are completely white. That has been bleached most likely by an infection or some kind of environmental effect that have killed the symbiont. And the coral cannot sustain life without that symbiont. So this is just an idea that even today, the fitness of an organism, it's benefited from having a symbiotic relationship with another microorganism that in this case is giving it photosynthetic powers. Anyway, I'll stop there. I'll make a movie out of this and again post that up for you so you can see it again. I'll make sure that I didn't make any mistakes with my pronunciation. And I will make another quick little quiz and put it online so you don't miss the points of the quiz that way. You did the quiz already, right? Okay, good. I'll see you then on Thursday and God willing, we're going to have a lecture already online for you over the weekend. So we're going to go back to the reverse lecture. Talk to you soon, guys.